past week, I attended the Overlook Film Festival in New Orleans with my buddy Cody Leach. So today I'm gonna stop and rank all 12 Overlook Film Festival movies that I saw from the worst to the best. As you watch the video, let me know which of the movies that I discuss in this video are you most excited to check out. The thing that I love about going to these film festivals is that I discover movies that weren't on my radar at all, and hopefully I can let you know about some of them so that you can check them out. Now, as we go into this, I saw 10 of these movies at the Overlook Film Festival, and then there's two movies on this list that I didn't actually see at Overlook, but I saw them at South by Southwest, and then they played at Overlook. Other great thing about film festivals is that you get to spend a bunch of time with other film lovers, you get to make new friends, and then you get to meet a bunch of people in the space. So, uh, of course, I went with my buddy Cody Leach. We shared an Airbnb, so I got to spend the whole time together. But then also while there, got to connect with a, a buddy, according to Seth, is kind of his online handle, someone I met at Fantastic Fest. I actually stayed at his house in Arizona when I went out to Zach Pope's wedding last month, or now a couple months back. And then I just met several other creators, made some new friends, Gigi from Room for Scream, Deep Red, Perfect Blue, Blonde Tourage, just a cool experience. And then we actually got to work the red carpet at the world premiere of Abigail, got to ask Radio Silence a question, which was a neat experience. With that in mind, all throughout the video, I'm gonna have them kind of share some of their favorite movies or maybe a favorite moment from a movie, kind of giving some different perspectives. And so it was just a, a really neat week. With all that said, Let's get started. Last, Blackout. This is a werewolf film that actually comes out this month. And I hate to say what I'm about to say, but this is probably my least favorite film that I've ever seen at a film festival. And as soon as the movie ended, that's essentially what Cody Leach said to me. Normally, with films that I see at film festivals, something's always my least favorite. But... I find something interesting in it. I can understand why someone else would connect and resonate with that film. Even the next two movies on this list that, you know, they're number 10 and 11, I, I would recommend those films for a lot of you to check out and see. There's something interesting in them worth checking out for specific people. But when it comes to Blackout, I just didn't think there was anything all that interesting. It's just kind of a, a very straightforward, werewolf story that's not executed all that well. It's just a, a low-budget werewolf film. And so essentially you have a guy th that pretty clearly has turned into a werewolf and most of the movie is him walking around town having the same conversation with people where they're like, where have you been the last month? He's like, oh, I'm working stuff out. And then he goes to the next place and they go, where have you been the last month? And he goes, I've been working stuff out. And that's like the runtime of the movie is a lot of that. And then there's all sorts of parts that in order for the plot to happen, it's just filled with insanely stupid decision making. And that would make it like, OK, just a, a kind of a mediocre film. But there's also just like there's literally a scene in the movie where someone walks outside and right before they walk outside, they go, I'll be right back. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back, because you won't be back. They literally say, I'll be right back, not ironically, post scream. <laughs> like that's in this movie. And there's, there's also like a, a, a racial component to it, but it's not actually saying anything. It just kind of puts it in there. And so it's very off-putting and it's, it's handled in just the wrong way. And so it just had nothing to offer that I thought was good. Number 11, In a Violent Nature. So the basic idea of this film is essentially you're watching a Friday the 13th movie that is 75% from the perspective of Jason Voorhees, or as the character, and this is called Johnny. And so it's almost doing like a video game third person shot during a large percentage of the runtime as you're following him around doing these kills. I think In the Violent Nature doesn't fully work for me, but it's an interesting experiment. If you're a slasher fan, if you're a fan in particular of Friday the 13th, Jason Voorhees, 
I very much recommend you check it out just to see how you connect with it because it's worth experiencing. Does it fully work? Well, well no, it does not. And there's a, the primary big gigantic reason for that is a large percentage of what Jason Voorhees, or as the character's known in this, Johnny, does is just walk through the woods. And so I think, believe even from the trailer footage that you're seeing, a very large percentage of the film is just this character walking through the woods. And before it started and during the Q&A afterwards, they kept making joke about how soothing the movie was because it's just him walking through the woods with this like consistent metronome sound that's soothing. And when the kills happen, a number of them are quite good. One of them, the yoga kill, is an all-timer. That coming out of the movie, everyone was talking about the yoga kill. In a violent nature, it had one of the gnarliest kill <laughs> yeah. scenes I've ever seen. So that was that was a fun time. It's inventive. It's clever. Like they they very much went all out on this one kill. And there's a few other ones where they did some cool stuff. But when you watch a slasher from the perspective of the killer, all tension is removed. And I said the movie's about 75% from his perspective and there's kind of like towards the end there's a section where you do get the perspective of some of the the, the non-killer characters and immediately you feel tension. And you hadn't noticed how absent the film was of tension until it switches perspective and you're like, oh crap. And you realize one of the ways in which the movie didn't work. But if you're a slasher fan, it's worth experiencing at least once. In particular, Friday the 13th, Jason Voorhees, worth checking out. There is an all-time kill in here. Number 10, Azrael. And the basic premise of this film is that it's set after the rapture in the Bible, so post-apocalyptic, and a group of people basically to atone for their sins of speech have severed their vocal cords so they can't talk and you're following this couple in the woods while they're basically being chased by this cult uh, that is trying to like basically sacrifice them to the burnt, where there's these essentially zombies that are burnt humans roaming around. So the crazy humans, the burnt people, dangerous world, and there's no dialogue that you can understand in the entire film. And it was written by the person that wrote Your Next, a movie I really enjoy, and it stars Samara Weaving, an actress that I love in these types of movies. This is one of the films that I saw at South by Southwest, not at the Overlook Film Festival, but it did play at the Overlook Film Festival. But so as for me in this movie, the reason it didn't work for me is that at its core, it's like a lot of other things where it's post-apocalyptic, there's zombies roaming around, but the humans are just as dangerous as the zombies. This is, you know, basic plot line of The Walking Dead. So the thing that makes this one pop a little bit more is kind of its religious ties, ties to the book of Revelation in the Bible, the rapture, a lot of Bible verses, prophets, all that stuff being flashed on screen um, and religious imagery all this lore is what really makes it different. The problem is the characters can't talk. So you have, it alludes to a bunch of lore that we don't get to really see. And I think that just holds the movie back from popping enough. Not having enough answers to important questions. It didn't fully work for me when I saw it at South by Southwest. But... Everyone else I talked to loved it. For example, my friends from Overlook. What's your latest favorite film of the festival? Azrael, and it, it's not even close. I'm literally speechless. Samara Weaving, like an unstoppable machine that refuses to give up. It's literally the descent meets like religious horror. It is bloody, it is violent. And I, like I've never seen a silent film just blow me away. I, like, fuck, it was so good. It was so good. And that, I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Azrael, I just got out of it. I almost started crying because it was like so good. It is, there's barely any dialogue like whatsoever, but it is just scary and 
anxiety inducing and creepy and it goes there and I loved it. It's one of my new favorite films of all time. <laughs> So I saw it at South by Southwest, but I was in a bad mood. It was a weird morning, and so I was negative on it. And I knew I'm supposed to like this movie. Everyone else is loving it. Yeah. It's got to just be me. Don't listen to him. It's great. It's great. <laughs> That's exactly exactly why I do these interviews, because sometimes I'm way off base. <laughs> I loved it. Azrael, uh, it's the new Simon Bar written by Simon Barrett film. Um, I, that man never does me no wrong. It's tomorrow weaving. It's no dialogue heaven, but it's all adrenaline. It's all gas, no breaks. I love that one too. I think uh, if you've been a big fan of everyone involved in that, it's, it's easy to recommend. Number nine, humanist vampire seeking consenting suicidal person. Now to be perfectly clear, when it comes to this ranking, numbers nine through two on this list, where there's very little gap between number nine and number two. So even though this is number nine on the list, I really dug this film. I thought it worked. I thought it was interesting. And trying to decide which one was number nine versus number eight versus number seven, they're all very close. So when it comes to cons uh, humanist vampire seeking consenting suicidal person, this is a French Canadian film. It's in French. Uh, so I, this was the last film that I saw at the film festival. It was subtitled and I was very tired when I watched this movie and the subtitles moved very fast and this wasn't stadium seating. So I actually was only able to read about 60, 75% of the subtitles because they were low on the screen, small, and there were heads in the way. Keep that in mind. This film won the, or was the runner-up for the Audience Award for this film festival. It was the second most popular film with audiences, and in fact, my friends that I went to go see it with had this to say about it. What was your favorite film from the festival? It has to be Humanist Vampire, Seeking Consenting Suicidal Person. Absolutely amazing. I was not even on my radar. It's a foreign film. Everybody has to watch it. It's my favorite. It's my whole personality now. Yeah, that's the fun ones. When you have no idea what it is, you show up yeah. and it turns out to be your favorite. I just saw the long title and said, I'm going to give this a shot. And it was amazing. Yeah, I, I wasn't on my radar. I was like, what on earth is this thing? Yeah. And then you guys were raving about it. Yeah, and I honestly have no idea when it's coming out in the United States. But when it does, everybody needs to see it. My favorite film of the festival was Humanist Vampire Seeking Consenting Suicidal Person. Very long title, but it is a coming of age vampire movie that I very much so loved. And it's just a beautiful story about life finding your meaning, and so much more. It's absolutely hysterical. I'm a sap and a romantic, so I also really liked Humanist Vampire. That one is a genre blender, so don't go into it expecting pure horror. Um, a bunch of people have been mentioned. We weren't going to see it until everyone was recommending it, so that's actually what we just got out of. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a top recommendation for me, for sure. Where can we find you on the internet? Room for a Scream on TikTok. You can find me at According to Seth on all pages, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and make sure you hit that follow button. Okay, so I'm Elaine with Deep Red Perfect Blue. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram, but I'm kind of creeping my way over to YouTube and TikTok. The fact that it's number nine on this list does not, like I said, I think this is a good film. I enjoyed this film. But with my viewing experience, I resonated with the films higher up on this list more. But what essentially what this is, is it's a coming of age vampire story about this teenage vampire who doesn't want to kill people. And so she's trying to find someone that she wants to kill. So she's looking for a suicidal human. And of course, she finds this boy who's suicidal, but she also realizes that she really likes him. It's this quirky, offbeat humor that, as you can imagine, it plays better when you're able to read 100% of the words and not 75% of the words and not compounded by the fact that you're tired. Next up, Infested. This is a spider infestation film, which comes out this month on Shudder. And the director of this movie was announced earlier this year as directing the next Evil Dead film. So if you are an Evil Dead fan, you probably should check out this movie simply to just get prepared for the next Evil Dead film. This is another one that is in French and subtitled. So when it comes to Infested, essentially it's about this guy that lives in this skyscraper apartment complex. He collects spiders and essentially one of them gets loose. 
the building gets quarantined and the spiders keep reproducing and getting bigger and bigger very, very quickly. So it's about essentially him kind of reconnecting with, with his family and some friends that just happened to be at the apartment complex that day while they're desperately trying to escape. You pretty quickly realize that the director has a as really nice use of the camera, camera movements, that sort of thing. Immediately, you you feel the danger, you feel the situations. It's good at building tension when you see a person walk up to something and the camera moves inside of that thing, the person that they're reaching for. Really good at putting you on the edge of your seat. Number of really solid situations where they find all sorts of little details, whether like light timers in apartments and using that to just create urgency and sequences. It, it lost me a little a little bit in the, the third act where they're trying to create human villains in the story and the final choices that are made to give us our big third act showdown just felt did, like it didn't make any sense to me why this character would make this choice. Main bulk of the film is very effective, in particular if you're afraid of spiders, if you like that sort of thing. There's a lot to enjoy in this film. Today's video is brought to you by Raycon. It's that time of the year where I have to mow my lawn every single weekend. I'm trying to work out more and everything is better with Raycon's everyday earbuds. Raycon's offer amazing quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. Don't believe me? How about their tens of thousands of five-star reviews? Raycon's optimized gel tips are designed to comfortably fit into your ears to actually stay there, whether you're going for a jog or mowing the lawn. With eight hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life, whatever I'm up to, they're up for the task. Over this past weekend, I went to a film festival in Louisiana. I had to fly out there, wait in a bunch of lines, fly back. The whole time, I'm using my Raycons, and on a single charge, they were able to last the entire trip. They have three customizable sound profiles, so I can get perfect sound whether I'm listening to music or an audiobook. They also have a noise isolation mode as well as an awareness mode so I can hear what my kids are up to while still listening to an audiobook. Go to buyraycon.com slash Sean Chandler today to get 20% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's right, you'll get 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash Sean Chandler. Buyraycon.com slash Sean Chandler. Number seven, New Life. This is a bit of a genre bender where it's about this girl that's on the run from a governmental authority and she's being tracked down by a fixer. And these two characters are kind of the co-leads of the film. And there's this kind of mystery surrounding why are they hunting this girl? How much does each person know? So there's kind of a sense of paranoia, uh, a little bit of, you know, big government conspiracy type stuff. There's clearly something that she has that's dangerous. And there's the mystery of where it came from. And so kind of a manhunt person, but the, the fixer that's chasing her also has a, a kind of her own backstory of her own personal struggles and everything kind of going on with her. It's kind of like a very character-based film that's a manhunt story with each person trying to deal with where they're at in life. There are some twists and turns and reveals that I didn't see in the trailer, so I'm holding back some specific details, which... Uh, when talking about movies like this, when you see them so far in advance, you start to realize the, how difficult it is to sell someone on a movie without spoiling things. But it's pulling from several different genres. It does a good job of having that intrigue with these mysteries surrounding exactly kind of what's what's going on. And you, you kind of buy into it. You, you care about these characters, the consequences of their choices. Once again, kind of like with Infested, when it comes to like the, the final resolution it plays out a little bit like you wanted a little bit more or you wanted some justice on a few things or you want a few more answers to what happened. So it wasn't as fully satisfying as I hoped. Number six, Dead Mail. This is a quirky thriller. It's very offbeat. It's filled with dark humor, very peculiar characters. It's set in the 80s and has very much this retro aesthetic to everything taking place 
And the the basic plot line to it, the basic concept of it, is that someone has been kidnapped and he's able to get a some note into the mail, but it's not properly addressed. And when a letter isn't properly addressed, it's called dead mail, and it's sent to a specific person to try and figure out the right place to put it. So then the postal service gets this weird note and that's a warning of a person being kidnapped and they're trying to figure out what to do with that. What it, what does it mean? And the investigation that goes along with that. So that's the trying to put the setup to it, but it's, it's non-linear. The story shifts perspective on the characters frequently, sometimes playing events from different characters' perspectives, all kind of tracking this kidnapping, the letter, all these different pieces with this very odd, quirky vibe to it. And the the kidnapper in this is the most pathetic villain I've seen in a horror film thriller in, in like forever. And I say that as a compliment. It is a little bit slow paced and in the middle it feels like we get a little bit lost in some of the backstory of the relationship between two of the characters. And there's a there's a lot in here about building synthesizers, which dis- whatever it is, describe the rest of the movie. And then it's like, but the movie's about building synthesizers. Like, what are you talking about? That's the quirkiness and the offbeatness of this movie. So several people at the festival loved this movie. What was your favorite film from the festival? Um, I think Dead Mail, honestly. Dead Mail was fantastic. Uh, very niche movie, I feel. Um, a lot of people didn't like it, but I surprisingly liked it. Yeah, we got out of the theater. I was like, I kind of dug that, like a weird offbeat yeah, vibe. And right. everyone in the car was like, yeah. I'm not sure if I liked that. Yeah, for sure. Recommend it 10 out of 10. But one of the smaller films that we absolutely loved was Dead Mail. That, to me, was a perfect, perfect film. I agree with her. Yeah, so we got to our car after watching Dead Mail. Two of us were like, oh, that was really cool. Offbeat, different. The others were like, ah, I didn't really like that one. So it's fascinating. Really? It was polarizing. Yeah, like Cody wasn't a big fan of it. Oh, I was like, what? No. That was really fun. And one of the other guys in the car was like, yeah, that was my favorite of the festival. So, so that you was, saw it? I saw it with them, yeah. I dug it. I, th- I liked it. I like offbeat, different, a bit of a mystery. Yeah. So it worked for me. But it's always interesting how um, you find these movies that people respond to so differently. Yeah. EB underscore Chamberlain. Uh, that's really it. Blontourage reviews. Yeah, and well we're on we're on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. So I enjoyed it a good bit. I did think it was a little bit too long, and I, you know, there were a few things in the resolution where I, I would have liked a bit more to it. Number five, things will be different. This is a time travel story of sorts, but it's more a time travel lore story, where essentially, prior to the events of the film. A brother and sister have committed a crime and they have a bag of money. And essentially there's this house that can travel through time and it's used as a safe house for criminals to be able to wait for things to lay low. And then they go back in time to to escape out of it. But they end up getting stuck at the house and being stuck in time with things that they have to do. And they're communicating to people at a different point in time using communication techniques and writing on the walls and notes and recorders and stuff like that. And so it's, it's kind of claustrophobic close quarters thriller where they're trying to figure out how to escape while there's people showing up that they're supposed to kill that are trying to kill them. We're trying to figure out who's on the other end of the, the, the phone and the writer director of the film basically said that, he made the movie as someone that loves time travel stories and loved watching some of the ambiguous time travel stories so that afterwards he could talk with his friends, family, with their theories about everything that was going on. And that's really what this movie is. It's intentionally ambiguous. You don't know exactly the nature of the house, the technology. It alludes to a bunch of bigger things. It alludes to crimes in the past. It alludes to the nature of the loops and all all kinds of different things in here. But it doesn't give a lot of definitive answers. And that's you know one of the best things about the film. And that's the most frustrating thing about the film. I wish that it gave me a little bit more to answer a few questions. I think it would have made it a little bit more satisfying if they were able to do that. Um, but it's 
it's still one of those ones that, you know, kept me on the edge of my seat and kept me wondering like, what's kind of going on here? I was asking all the right questions. Number four, Cuckoo. This is one I was actually able to watch at both South by Southwest at its world premiere and then watched it a second time at the Overlook Film Festival. It's about a girl who moves in with her father in Europe at kind of this isolated resort where her dad's helping expand things. And she has a, a stepmother and stepsister there and or half sister there. And essentially something weird's going on, as you can imagine. And as it goes along, it gets weirder and weirder and weirder. It manages to have a nice naturalistic sense of humor where the characters are, it's not quips and jokes. It's like people note, like pointing out the weirdness taking place in the story. There's some very effective sequences. One in particular with the girl riding her bike home. Dan Stevens is great as this guy who's, well, he's just so good at playing a charismatic creep. Like, he get, holds your attention. You love it when he's on screen. And as I said before, it, it does a good job of just like, it starts off normal. And then you start seeing something like, that was a little bit weird. And then the first time you kind of have an attack in the story, you're like, well, that was weird. And then it, it just like starts shifting into other genres of weirdness and craziness and investigations. And by the end of it, it's just, it's wild bonkers. There's this whole lore and mythology. I'm still not sure that everything fully makes sense or everything fully adds up. If you like a little bonkers in your horror thrillers, be on the lookout for this one. Cuckoo, which was the opening film, surprised the shit out of me. That one's still kind of in my head. So you- Both Dan Stevens. Both Dan Stevens. He's having he's a good a, year. He's on a roll. Well, Godzilla vs. Kong wasn't quite me, but you know, he's he's brought me back to the Dan Stevens train this weekend. So either one of those you see, you'll be happy. But I'm gonna have to say Cuckoo if I'm going with one. It was constantly surprising, which is something I'm always looking for, especially as a horror fan. Um, it was funny and absurd, and in parts it was super terrifying. So I would have to go with Cuckoo uh, right now as my favorite. What was your favorite film from South by Southwest? You might as well just pull it on up there real quick. We got our Cuckoo, loved it. I knew I was gonna love it. It feels so genre, it's genre, blends. it's gonzo. I think it's only worked for a small niche of people. People who like their movies to be outrageous, outlandish, and just a wild ass time. That's me, I had a great time with Cuckoo. If you've loved Tillman Singer's other films, you're gonna love this film. Hey, remember to join me down below in the comments section. Share which of the movies I've talked about in here you're most excited to check out. Also, my friends that I went to the festival with also covered the festival and the films that we saw there. So Cody Leach did his own ranking a couple days ago. And then several other people that I talked to also are and then featured in this video did their own recaps or individual reviews or interviews, all of that fun stuff. So try and link to a bunch of that down below in the description as well as some, some cards up here. In third, Arcadian. This is the other film which I actually saw at its world premiere at South by Southwest. I did not watch watch it at Overlook, but it did play at Overlook. Cody Leach watched it at Overlook, but once again, I'm trying to cover more movies, and so I wanted to include it in here. This movie actually releases today in theaters, so I believe, I don't know how wide the release is, but it is available to watch now in theaters. Essentially, this is A Quiet Place minus the sound gimmick plus... Nicolas Cage and cool creature design. That, that's what it is. Where if A Quiet Place is kind of post-apocalyptic story about a family and how they're learning to adapt and survive afterwards, family drama and tension, and then things go crazy and they have to adjust. That's what this is as well with, you know, it's kind of own distinct flavor to it. I like this kind of movie. I thought that this one was, it was pretty effective at everything that it was doing to. The thing that really elevates it is a very solid creature design. When it reveals kind of how the creature attacks, everyone after we watched it was talking about the specific attack structure it has. And then in the third act, it does, the creatures do something even different. And it keeps doing cooler and cooler things with the creatures. It's also essentially a story about brothers and brothers, how, how they fight and how they love one another. And it's about how we adapt and how, you know, these families 
just get used to the fact that there's killer creatures out there that you have to avoid and the rules to it. They just kind of adapt to it and it becomes the norm everyday life of living in, in this insanity. Um, and so it, it's, it's definitely familiar, but it's effective at a familiar formula. Arcadian, uh, the mon there are monsters that in it that are just terrifying and they continue to be surprising right. and terrifying. There's all these different ways they keep doing things. They're like, uh oh, that yeah. too? Our runner up, Oddity. This movie actually played at South by Southwest, but I missed it at South by Southwest. And at both South by Southwest and the Overlook Film Festival, it won audience awards. So at the Overlook Film Festival, it was the audience award winning film. And then at South by Southwest, Oddity won the horror film audience award. A lot of people really enjoyed it. Central idea of this film is that a essentially a woman was murdered at her home a year prior and her blind twin sister, who's a medium, is trying to figure out what really happened. And it's essentially just her at the house at the one year anniversary of the death. That's like 80% of the film is that. And it's just, it basically takes the, the haunted house ghost story formula, kind of flips it on its head. It has a really nar nice, eerie sense of humor about it with the way that it just plays some things. It uh, has some nice scares or I guess startle scares, jump scares with the way that it uses some of the props because she's medium. She has all these, she has a store of supernatural oddities, hence the title, hence the weird wooden guy right there. So there's all these weird artifact things she has and finds ways to do creepy things with all of it. And you're slowly unraveling this mystery and revealing more and more details about who did what, who knew what, why was each person where they were at, and it just kind of slowly reveals things, reverses things. At first, you take one side and you switch to the other side. And you're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it? Oh, it's actually this. But overall, nicely scripted something different. But coming in at number one is Abigail. This was the closing night film of the festival. It was the movie's world premiere and the director's radio silence were in attendance. And I actually was able to work the red carpet with Cody Leach. Number one on this list, and very distinctly number one on this list, without question, this was my favorite film of the festival, and it delivered everything that I hoped it would. It is a vampire ballerina story about a group of kidnappers that kidnap a little girl. Turns out she is a vampire ballerina, and they are trapped in this mansion with her, and they're trying to survive while she is playing with her food. It is filled with all sorts of nasty, gory violence. It has balances the horror and the comedy just about right. But one of the things that's a really nice touch here is that the cast of characters complement each other really well. During the Q&A afterwards, Radio Silence said that they were really trying to do essentially like Breakfast Club with... Um, as a horror film with these, these grown up kidnappers. And you kind of feel that where it's a series of different characters with different skills, different personalities, all put in this situation. So each of them bring a different energy, a different dynamic into the story, different way that they entertain you or compel you. It just worked on every single level for me, but not just for me. It was also a favorite of a bunch of other people at the festival. Stranger, what was your favorite films of the festival? Stranger's favorite film of the festival was <laughs> Abigail. Uh, I expected to like it. I didn't expect to like fucking love it, which I absolutely do. Abigail was very, very fun. I really liked that. Uh, Abigail, we just got out of the premiere, the world premiere, and it was great. Yeah, just a ton of fun. Just yeah. delivered. Yeah. And my tied for first place with that movie is Abigail because I love Radio Silence. Ready or Not is my all-time favorite horror comedy, and this just ups the ante, and it is a bloody wild ride. I have to say it was Abigail. Abigail. It was so much fun. Um, and it had everything I wanted in a movie. Definitely. Comedy, gore, scares, mm -hmm. action, uh, relationships between the characters. I just loved it. 
What I wanted from the film is what I got watching it. Abigail was one that I think absolutely delivered, so it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my coverage of South by Southwest right over here. Check out Cody Leach's ranking right down there, as well as I've links to my other friends' videos down below in the description. Hey, thank you so much for watching, and keep talking movies and TV.